Okay, I'm Staticus. I'm a Bitcoin minimalist and a full node maximalist. So, um, since the beginning of my own Bitcoin journey, I wanted always to maximize my own digital sovereignty. So, building a full node from the beginning was a logical first step. But of course, then came Lightning, and I wrote a somewhat um, popular guide, the Raspberry Bolt, a guide that taught you to like set up everything yourself on a cheap Raspberry Pi over SSH on the command line, going through everything yourself. So I guess it's not for everybody, but it. I think it's more also about the journey, not only about the result, because it really does not depend on anything else. You do everything yourself. So today I work at Shift Crypto Security, um, and I'm basically doing the same, but from a complete, completely different angle. I'm trying to uh, build the most simple Bitcoin and Lightning node possible, as the title says. That so it's so easy that it can be run by your mom and pop. And um, the project is called Bitbox Base. Um, it's fully open source, um, but it's still a product that we want to sell. It's a key product of our company, and um, we're building it in the fu fully in the open. So while it's a product that we want to sell, like regularly, I give um, firmware updates, like provide support, I still want to keep it as a possible DIY project, so you can build it yourself, you can build the operating system, you can buy standard components and do everything yourself. So this is, for me personally, very important. To give you a little bit of context where that all fits in, um, our mission is to build an ecosystem of products, like hardware and software products, that give you personal financial sovereignty. So we are manufacturer of hardware wallets. We have our own um, software. At the moment, it's desktop, but we're releasing a mobile app for the Bitcoin uh, wallet um, shortly. And we want to also provide your own personal backend so that hardware wallet no longer needs to call home all the time. Um, so it's about financial sovereignty, which is cool because this is my own goal anyway. So I'm a happy guy there. And yeah, um, we're focusing on usability, security, and privacy. Privacy for me personally is super important. So having everything open source is cool because if I gave a presentation like that, I can just go to GitHub screenshots. Um, Everything we do is open source, the firmware, this project, you can just check it out on GitHub. And in this talk, I would like to highlight a few key aspects that we um, decided upon, having some design goals um, with the technical implications um, that might differ a bit from other projects. I don't want to re repeat the obvious, but there are some aspects that we are doing differently, and I want to quickly talk about these so the key design goals that I want to talk about is I really want to make a super easy node that everybody can run. I personally like our own um, Bitbox app a lot. It's super simple. It's very minimalistic. It has like already built-in support for your own um, full node with a recipe blitz. Works perfectly. Um, but I want to have a freaking lightning wallet in there, right? Um, privacy for me is important, and I just want to have it by default. I don't want to be able or need to set all the privacy stuff like in complicated settings pages. And the last thing is a, as well a personal goal. I want to have super reliable firmware upgrades because that makes me sleep at night. I mean, my worst nightmare probably is I have like thousands of devices out there, which which is good, but then brick them all at once with like a, a botched update, which would be super bad. So I'll talk about these four design goals. 
and let's start with the first one. So, making a note for everybody means that it needs to be super easy. And I think that starts with the setup. Um, but it also should not really fail, so it needs to be resilient. And if it should fail at some point in time, it should be forgiving, like making it easy to get it back into the state it's supposed to be. And I also think that creating a product that is very focused um, is important to make it easy to use. So if I'm talking about easy setup, we very early on um, decided that we don't want to have a web server on the device. Because for me personally, having a security device that is on the network, providing a web server is kind of a compromise I don't really want to do. Um, and if we have the app that makes us so much more stuff easier, we can do automatic network detection. So you plug in the base, it just pops up in your app. The first thing you do is to open an end-to-end -end encrypted channel. You will need to physically confirm the pairing code on the device and in the app. And from that point in time, you're basically only communicating through an encrypted channel. You need to set a password to access it later because there are fonts on it and all that stuff. Then you choose what you want to do as a setup. The quick setup, we think, is for like non-technical users. You start with a pre-synced blockchain. I know, I know. But I think there, um, you're somewhat trusting us anyway. So there is a use case to use a pre-synced blockchain and be up and running in like five minutes. And the whole device is Tor only by default. But of course, you have the option to do a custom setup. And we provide two options. The first one is to just wipe the whole UTXO set and revalidate everything from scratch, but with the blocks that are already on the device. Or you just wipe the damn thing and download everything. But I personally don't think that adds that much security. It's more of a like psychological thing. Well, and we ship with a um, USB stick already plugged in. So you have like create a backup, everything is dumped onto the USB stick, and you're basically set and run. So this is what I think should could be, could a very easy setup look like. A networked device can really be a pain in the ass. So especially if it's not networked anymore. Um, I personally think that having a screen um, that can provide some very basic information, if it's not like reachable on the network, helps a lot. If you have like buttons and uh, RGB LEDs to indicate a status, that it's even better. So you don't even need to open the app to see if everything is working fine. I think that communicating with the user on a very intuitive level, just have a green light on it, is pretty important. Finally, um, having a very focused product. Um, this is, I think, where we differ a little bit from other projects. Um, I think makes it a lot easier to not accumulate like technical debt. I'm not sure we can do everything and do it in the same quality as if it is just one thing. And think about the whole bit of space as one product. This is why we chose um, early on to run Bitcoin Core together with Sea Lightning. Um, we're using a full Electrum server, Electrus, Electrum server in Rust. Everything is running over Tor by default. Uh, we're using Nginx as a reverse proxy and to do all the SSL stuff. We're using Redis for the configuration management. Um, Prometheus is running on the Bitbox base to do all the system monitoring writing everything into a time series database. And optionally, it's off by default, but if you want to do, you can enable a Grafana display that gives you more technical insight or debugging information if you want to have that. At the moment, it's more for development for ourselves. So we don't really let you choose, for example, 
uh, between L and D and C Lightning. Um, but I think we can build a better product if we do that in the beginning and work with that set of products. And in the end, I think the end user should not really need to care what implementation he runs. Just run. So, I mean, it's it's a protocol. It's a, everything should be um, interoperable. So it's our job to just make it work. So if I use a Bitcoin wallet, I want to have it like layer one Bitcoin and layer two lightning network stuff do as best as possible. And there are great wallets out there. But I really, for myself, I care also about like having integration with hardware wallets. But I still want lightning and I want to run my own backend. So it's not really out there yet. Um, additionally, I have a, a lot of different end devices. So I don't really want to ch manage my channels on the mobile phone and on the desktop and everywhere. So for me personally, it makes a lot of sense to have all the infrastructure, the lightning, the plumbing in one place, having it stable over time and just reuse that set of features on all my end devices. Um, having it on 24-7 makes a lot of stuff easier. Um, having Tor by default, um, I think it's, it's a must, especially for Lightning. I don't want to broadcast my IP address to the whole world. And what I'm really excited about is having all these C Lightning server-side plugins, like Advanced Autopilot. Um, I personally want to be able to open maybe five channels proposed by an autopilot from my hardware wallet with one Bitcoin transaction. And I think that is almost possible and that features can be added to C Lightning with server-side plugins. So we don't really need to have everything baked in. So this is really cool. Um, privacy is important. And your Bitcoin full node is your source of truth. It handles your financial information. So that's very sensitive data. You should really um, take care of that. Do not leak that stuff to anybody that wants to listen. I just recently read this amazing book by Edward Snowden, a Permanent Record. I think it fits very well in this talk because it's really written for mom and pop as well. It's very non-technical. Um, and it highlights a lot of scary stuff that we maybe are not aware. Um, and if we have his sad eyes watch over, like when we go through these options, um, for me personally, having anything over clear text is a total no-go. Being it just communication or like secrets that go back and forth. The next option would be to have like self-signed TLS certificates, which is which are great um, from a technical perspective. But there all, are all these like very scary browser warnings that pop up and you're not really protected against man in the middle. So um, yeah, that's definitely a, st a step in the right direction. But as we have the app anyway, we decided to go full in and do full end-to-end -end encryption. We, our wallet um, app, the only endpoint that we have that is publicly accessible on the Bitbox base is to open an encrypted noise channel. So um, the first thing you do um, is connect to the base. You open a secure channel using the noise protocol framework. It's basically what Lightning Network uses, but also what WireGuard is using. And from that point in time on, everything is encrypted. And it doesn't matter what you're using, if it's like just clear text or Tor or whatever, the data is safe. So coming to my last personal nightmare, um, my vision for the Bitbox space is to really build it as an appliance. I don't want to like ship a little Linux server. It should be an appliance. And for the, the user, the main difference is the, re uh, the resilience. I should be able to just yank out the power, 
power spec up, everything fine, no no file system corruption, stuff like that. And one thing we do for that, for example, is that the whole root file system is read-only. I think that's a must. Otherwise, you're really in danger if you have like sudden power outage. Um, but the resilience is also super important if you're doing firmware upgrades. So in my, I think we have like ba three basic options to do remote updates of a device like that. The first is roll your own, which is kind of bad, like with um, cryptography. Um, I think it's game over from day one. If you do like your own bash scripting stuff, you're just accumulating all little issues and technical depth, and you'll never get back to like a reliable state once you have anything wrong. The second option is to modularize all the services, for example, with Docker, which is cool, because everything, every time you boot, you're booting into a, a reproducible state of the application. It becomes a little bit tricky because there are like independencies between the different Dockerized services that can be out of sync. And of course, it doesn't allow you to update the operating system itself. So then for that, you maybe you need to fall back to scripting. So for an appliance, best practice is to do full disk image updates, meaning you're basically overwriting the whole uh, root file system, which is amazing that you can actually do that remotely because it gives you a, a very well-defined state and you can test that very, very uh, thoroughly uh, beforehand. But it's also tricky because imagine overwriting the root file system and then the power goes out. You basically end up with a brick device. And I don't, really don't want to do that. So we collaborated with Mender. Um, they're having an amazing solution. We brought their solution to the Rock Pro 60 board, uh, 64 board we're using. And basically works like this. So we have uh, the root file system is in dual partitions, um, an active one and a passive one. You're only running the active one, obviously. But if you're doing an update, you're streaming a signed um, full disk size image to the passive root file system. And then you reboot into that updated partition. Then you can do a lot of system checks, see if all the services come up. If everything is okay, you commit the update. But if anything bad happens, if the services fail or if it doesn't boot at all, you just like reboot again and it falls back to the old system that was running. So this is basically how most operating uh, like appliances like mobile phones or router work. We have the luxury to have really a redundant root file system. So this is pretty cool. And it's not really visible, but most of the slides actually have a link down here. So everything is documented, everything is online. So make sure to check that out if you're interested. And yeah, I mean, these were like just four little things from the trenches. Um, the project is still under heavy development. We have it to show outside, but it's, it's not production ready yet. Um, but we're ready to go into beta testing soon. And because a lot of people actually requested and wanted to be part of that again, because we have some track record with beta programs from the Bitbox O2, it's just a little bit more expensive for us to like give away devices like that. So we decided to um, create the, an early bird program. So we have, besides the, of the, like the select, already selected beta testers, we have five additional devices that we will um, provide for to the community to, to run their very first um, Bitbox base appliance. And it's not public yet, so you're the first ones to hear about that. Basically, we're um, giving away five devices um, and we throw in everything it is as proprietary. So um, you basically just need to pay for the, the Rock Pro board and the one terabyte SSD, stuff that you can use for other projects after that as well. And everything that is proprietary, like the screen, the case, the, the adapters, all that stuff, even the HSM, 
we are throwing for free. So I think somewhere this afternoon we'll have that on Twitter. So make sure to follow that uh, if you're interested and apply for that. And I hope to get some good feedback from, from this room. Thank you very much.